You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is Brian McClanahan. This is episode 29, and it covers the week of May 30th through June 3rd, 2016. Glad to have you back on the program. Uh, we've got a very important week in terms of the people that were born in this week. And we'll talk about all three of them. Uh, but before we do that, remember our summer school is coming up actually now uh, only a couple, well, less than two weeks away. Uh, so uh, not this next week, but the week after that. And uh, so if you uh, might be thinking about a last minute vacation uh, to the beach in South Carolina, contact Dr. Livingston and see if he can uh, get you in there. Uh, if not, we'll have one of these again next year. So uh, always in June, uh, we'll always have our summer school then. So make plans if you can't make it in 2016 to think about it in 2017. Also, we have a conference coming up August 13th, 2016 in Atlanta, Georgia on nullification. That should be a lot of fun. So uh, think about coming on out to that. It's only one day. It's only a one-day event. Uh, takes place from 10 to 3 on that Saturday. Uh, your conference free also covers lunch. So uh, it should be a good time. We have six speakers confirmed, and uh, uh, we'd love to see you out for that. Also remember that all of these things, the conferences, the podcast, the website, all the articles, everything we do at the Abbeville Institute is uh, only possible by your generous contributions. So think about a tax-deductible donation to the Abbeville Institute. Um, we do exist on your support alone. And uh, we do have some other things in the works. So we would like to, I uh, would love to have your support. And um, please consider that. All right, so all that out of the way, let's talk about the week at the Abbeville Institute. And more importantly, the people who made this week and the material that we had this week. So we have to start. Um, with a man whose birthday was actually on May 29th, but uh, we didn't run anything on Sunday. So, uh, and that's Patrick Henry. So, one thing we, we like to focus on in, at the Institute is the fact that Southern history is not just a four year period of 1861 to 1865. And I think too often we are uh, people in, in the South and across the United States in general get tied up in that period and think that's the only thing in Southern history that matters. But as we talk about over and over again at the Institute, Southern history is 400 years, and the South really is America. Southern history is American history. And you wouldn't have American history without the South. And I think one of the important developments that happened after the war was over in 1865 is that Northern history became American history, but it had never been that way. This is not to say that Northern history wasn't important, that there weren't important figures in Northern history. Of course there were. But almost everything we can think about that made America unique and made America great came out of the South. For example, the first permanent English colony in North America was at Virginia in Jamestown, the first attempt to settle an English colony in North America was in North Carolina, of course, what Sir Walter Raleigh called Virginia. And Virginia was the entire region, English region of North America. Virginia was North America until you had the Pilgrim's Land at Plymouth. So you can't get around the fact that the English established a foothold in North America first in the South. The first representative government in North America was in Virginia. The first Thanksgiving in North America was in Virginia. Thomas Jefferson was a Southerner. Of course, Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. And then you just move on from there. The American political tradition is decidedly Southern. The American uh, cause would not have been successful without Virginia and the South and the Carolinians. So you cannot get around the fact that the South was, and still is in reality, America, the quintessential American hero for much 
of American history was Daniel Boone. The quintessential American, the indispensable man, was George Washington, a Southerner. It's only after the war, and uh, Susan Mary Grant has done a very good job with this the, in her book North Over, the, Over South, the only, it was only after the war that the Northern narrative became the American narrative. And so I think that's something that we try to do, we try to hammer home at all times, is that Southern history really is American history. Also, if you want to get technical, you know, the first permanent European colony, European colony in North America was St. Augustine, which is in the South, in Florida. Um, so <clears throat> the South really has defined American history and America in general, and this is what we talk about. You know, this is the Southern tradition. This is what we're trying to explore. This is what is true and valuable. Decidedly, the Jeffersonian tradition and, of course, people get caught up in that four-year period, and they forget about the fact that the South has a longer history in North America. Southerners have a longer history in North America than any other people when you talk about the United States. So this is why we bring up Patrick Henry, who was a quintessential Southerner. I mean, Henry was very proud of the fact that he was from Virginia, that Virginia ran through his blood and bones. And the article we ran this week, of course, Patrick Henry's birthday, May 29th, the article we ran was from uh, the biography of Patrick Henry by Moses Coit Tyler. It's a very good biography. It came out um, in the 19th century. And this particular piece covers Henry's battle over the Constitution in Virginia. He was the, in many ways, he and George Mason were the last defense against the Constitution. Now, of course, Henry before this was perhaps in the top five in terms of most recognized people in, uh, in North America at the time in the United States. I mean, Henry had been governor of Virginia. He had made his very famous speech entitled The Illusions of Hope, which uh, is more famously known as Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death. And that, that speech single-handedly brought Virginia into the cause for independence. And what you have to remember, at the time, in the 1770s, the British made it very clear that they believed that one of the reasons why the United States were seeking independence is because of slavery. And this is often forgotten. The entire United States... What became the United States in 1776 was a slave-holding federal republic. It was only later that all these states abolished slavery. But uh, the British made it very clear this is what they believed. But, of course, we don't look at the war that way. Because it's a war for independence which is exactly what the war in 1861 was, a war of independence. And we'll talk about that when we get to the last article of the week. So Henry brings, delivers Virginia into the cause for independence, almost single-handedly. And I mean, it's a wonderful speech. But he also made some other, other very important speeches, in particular during the Virginia Ratifying Convention, when he stood against the tide. Henry saw in the Constitution problems for the future, and these problems have come to fruition. Henry was aware, for example, one of his famous speeches during the Philadelphia Convention, he started with this when he said, why we the people? Why not we the states? And what's interesting when you read that Virginia Ratifying Convention, the debates of the Virginia Ratifying Convention, it's not Henry's arguments that are important, and they are because he's pointing out, and he's very prescient, he's pointing out some of the things that are going to happen that end up, that end up happening today. I mean, we're, we're living in a, in a situation that Henry warned against and others of the opponents of the Constitution. But the important thing are the comments that were made by the proponents of the Constitution in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. The fact that the rejoinder as to why not we the states is that essentially everybody knew that we the people did not mean we the people in the aggregate. 
It meant we the people of the states. Henry was aware, though, that that term, we the people, even though the preamble carries no legal weight, that that term, we the people, could be used against the states in the future to, to say that this was a national government. And so Henry didn't like that because he understood that what we had had to that point was a federal republic. Now, one of, the, one of the arguments that's been made, and one of the reasons why people think that Henry opposed the Constitution so vehemently, is because he thought the states were going to be reduced in power and stature in this new Constitution. And he was right about that. And, of course, uh, Henry did not like James Madison. And one of the reasons why there's a theory that Madison wanted the Constitution so much and wanted to create more of a national government. I mean, Madison was a nationalist when he went to Philadelphia in, in May of 1787, was that he wanted to reduce the power of people like Patrick Henry. And as a result of the ratification of the Constitution, uh, there was going to be a Senate and a House of Representatives. And, of course, James Madison, who was very instrumental in the creation of the Constitution, was denied a seat in the Senate by Patrick Henry. And then he had to go around essentially with cap in hand to try to get people to vote for him to put him in the House of Representatives. Uh, so Henry was trying to block James Madison. And this is one of the reasons why Henry became a Federalist right near the end of his life. He, war he warned against the Constitution. Once we had it, and then people like Madison and Jefferson, now Jefferson warned against the Constitution too, but Madison was so ardently for it. Uh, so when these guys were for it, Henry became against it because Henry uh, was not necessarily a fan of either Thomas Jefferson or James Madison. Henry was a major critic of Jefferson when Jefferson was governor of Virginia. And so there was a personal dispute between these men. And, of course, Jefferson famously said that Henry was a lazy reader and he didn't write very well. And uh, you know, So he created this image of Henry as kind of an illiterate bumpkin. Uh, and Henry, you know, one of the things that we can say about that is Jefferson was not a very good speaker, but Henry was the best speaker in Virginia, if not the entire United States. And so there might have been a little jealousy there. So Henry makes several speeches in the Virginia Ratifying Convention against the Constitution. And in the last speech he made, and Tyler brings us to life very well, and it's right at the end of this of this. Uh, Piece, which was a chapter in his book on Patrick Henry. He talks about the fact that Henry, almost as if a magician or bringing in God himself, wills a thunderstorm to break out during this speech, and the storm became so violent that people were scrambling for cover, and Henry had to stop the speech, but it's almost as if during the speech, as the thunder of the speech became stronger and stronger, the thunder and the storm. The storm itself became stronger and stronger, and the windows broke open. And Henry had made his point. The Constitution was going to be dangerous. It was going to be dangerous for American liberty because it would be abused. And I think that's the most prescient thing the opponents of the document ever said, was that the Constitution would be abused. And they were right. That is exactly what has happened. The Constitution has been abused. Certainly, if you look at the Constitution and you look at the arguments for the Constitution, which is often considered to be the originalist position, we take the ratifying conventions, which James Madison himself said gave the, con gave the uh, Constitution its life. If you look at those ratifying debates, then everything the general government does outside of the scope of its enumerated granted or delegated powers, and as they said over and over again in the ratifying process, these are expressly delegated powers, everything the general government does is unconstitutional. And North and South, it was argued that should that happen, the states, as Roger Sherman of Connecticut said, would be powerful enough to check it. Of course, Jefferson and Madison came up with an idea on how to do that in the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. Now, one of the other reasons Henry became more of a Federalist uh, in his late in life was that he feared the French Revolution, because the French Revolution was different than the American War for Independence. 
drastically different than the American War for Independence. So uh, we often forget that they're not the same. You know, if you go into a history, uh, you know, a history 102, a Western Civ class in 102, and you talk about the French Revolution, or you take uh, maybe even an upper division course on the French Revolution from the Marxists who often now teach this subject, they're going to put the two together and say this is the age of revolutions and the American War for Independence started the process by which the French Revolution came about. There's, no, certainly there were people in the United States who favored the early stages of the French Revolution, but when it became bloody and it became nasty and it became something that was transformative, not just for the government of France, but for the entire society of France, these people recoiled. Even Jefferson himself recoiled at the shock that was going on in France. The American War for Independence was just that, a war for independence. It did not really change very much the status quo in what became the United States. So, when you look at Southern history, you have to consider a man like Patrick Henry, who was also worried about the effect that the Constitution would have on the South. He was concerned that the North would then swallow up the South, that the South would become dominated by the North. He was concerned about this. And so was George Mason, another very important Southern figure who's often overlooked. You know, George Mason was also concerned about this. This is why he was against what were called navigation laws essentially export taxes. He said the South will be taxed out of existence if we have these things. And Mason, uh, Mason's objections to the Constitution were read far and wide and replied to all over the United States in that ratification process. So, you know, Southerners put their stamp on the Constitution as well, both in helping draft it. You know, the Virginia Plan became the framework for the Constitution, the language of the Constitution itself, particularly the preamble and other things, came from Charles Pinckney of South Carolina. Everyone also points, uh, always points to Governor Morris, who, uh, you know, became one of the principal drafters of the Constitution, what became the final language in uh, one of the committees. But really, what he did was borrow from Madison's Virginia Plan and Pinckney's Plan, and put them together and create this this Constitution. So. You can't get around the fact that the Constitution is entirely Southern, really. And, and uh, the fact that people like Patrick Henry, without him, Virginia doesn't join the cause. And without Virginia, you don't have George Washington involved. And without Virginia, you don't have Yorktown. Without the South, you don't have Kings Mountain. You don't have uh, the British walloped over and over again, harassed in the South. So... The Southern theater became the important theater in the war, and the South became America. Southern heroes became American heroes. And at times, the North will co-opt these people and make them their own. You know, Patrick Henry isn't a Southerner, he's an American. But Henry himself recognized he was a Virginian, and Virginian was a Southerner, and he talked about the South quite extensively. George Washington is not a Southerner, he's an American, but he was a Virginian. His entire outlook on life was formed in Virginia. Thomas Jefferson isn't a Southerner. Well, he is. He's one that would be more convenient to be a Southerner because uh, everyone likes to focus on his supposed, which I argue is not true, indiscretions with Sally Hemings. Uh, so that, that makes him a Southerner. But uh, for a long time, Jefferson was an American. And you can go down the line of all the people that are Southerners that influenced American history and, and what became known as American were, in fact, Southerners. So this is why we talk about Patrick Henry. Because Southern history is American history, and it's a very long period of time, 400 years. Now on Tuesday, we ran a piece entitled Long Live the Flags of Dixie by Antonius Aquinas. And this little short piece um, brings up the fact, and we talked about this in last week's podcast, that Confederate battle flags are now illegal in national cemeteries, or they will be shortly. And we've talked about how the fact that the flags of Mississippi and Alabama and Florida have been removed from the uh, hallway that connects the offices of the members of Congress to the Capitol itself. And uh, how you know there's a there's a concerted effort 
to assault Southern symbols. Take them down, remove them. And the funny thing about that, and I'm not going to read too much into this piece, um, you know, Mr. Aquinas uh, gets into the fact that, about secession. I'll ta- I will talk about that. But the funny thing about all of this is while all these things are going on, we have rallies, political rallies now, where the U.S. flag is being burned and the Mexican flag is being proudly waved at these rallies. And we're talking about American elections. It's not happening in Mexico. In Mexico, fine. But a purely American symbol like the Confederate flag or the St. Andrew's Cross, which is the Alabama flag or the Florida flag or uh, the Arkansas flag is also under attack. Purely American symbols such as that are now being demonized and vilified because of an episode of violence that took place last year in Charleston, South Carolina. A terrible episode of violence, a real tragedy, something that never should have happened. And yet people are using other flags, other symbols to intimidate and attack American voters who are simply going to a political rally, and yet no one is talking about banning those symbols. No one is saying that, well, <laughs> this is a, these foreigners, because that's what they are. I mean, they're, they're gladly saying they're foreigners, are attacking American citizens, and there's no outcry. And yet, a purely American symbol, Southern symbols, which are purely American, that represent American people are now being made illegal. We live in an upside-down world. And I think that's something that um, we're losing sight of in all of this. And as we've said before on this, on this program, this podcast, and on the website, this is only the beginning. You know, Southern symbols are the low-hanging fruit. You pick them off first. And that's going to happen. I mean, it's, it's, it's happening all the time. You pick those off first, and then you go after everything else. Because progressives never stop at the low-hanging fruit. That's the easy part. That's the part you can get everyone to rally around. And then they get enough support, and then they go after everything else. And a nice example of that is you know, Memorial Day. Uh, there was a Vietnam Veterans Memorial in California that was vandalized. And people were shocked by this. But yet, when Confederate statues and memorials are vandalized, ah, they deserve it. But again, that's only the beginning in the irreverence that the left has for not just Southern history, but American history in general. And so people are shocked that someone might desecrate a Vietnam veteran's memorial, but don't blink an eye when they desecrate a Confederate veteran's memorial. To those who don't like American history, they are the same thing. In fact, Vietnam and its, uh, its imperialistic cause, I mean, this is how it's portrayed, the soldiers who fought and died over there, who were doing what they were told to do. Now, we can talk about whether uh, getting involved in Vietnam was a good idea, and there were a lot of Southerners who were against it, viewing it as a useless and unnecessary war. But that doesn't take away from the fact that Vietnam veterans were doing what they were told, but now they're, they're fair game too because that war to the progressive left was racist. And so... Uh, If you look at American diplomatic history, particularly beginning in the late 19th century, it's all racist. I mean, this is uh, diplomatic historians have started to talk about the influence of race in American foreign policy. And so Vietnam is simply an extension of that. And so you have to start putting the dots together. It's It's not a hard thing to do. It's not a complicated connect the dots. But this is what's happening. To the, to the progressive left, anything that is outside of their uh, worldview that doesn't make sense. It's not Marxist-influenced or uh, it's not politically correct. Anything is fair game to attack, and they're going to use all methods, violence, uh, crybaby intimidation at college events, 
trying to shout people down, vandalism. They're going to use anything they can to ensure that their message gets out. And the funny thing is about all of this is that people aren't blinking an eye at it. But put up a Confederate battle flag in a national cemetery on a grave of a Confederate soldier, and you've gone too far. But yet, go to a political rally with a flag that's not the U.S. flag, and burn the U.S. flag, and desecrate a Vietnam memorial, and you've gone, I mean, okay, that's, that's okay. That's just expressing yourself. So, again, we live in an upside-down world. Uh, it, it's amazing. And when I get to the last piece of the week, and when I talk about when it was written, how much has changed in that period of time? All right, so secession, the, the main part about the flags anyways is that you know one of the things they represent is opposition. Opposition to the Leviathan, opposition to the central authority. They do represent that. They are a symbol of of American resistance to central authority. And so now the flag is, if it's not being characterized as being racist, the other argument made against it is that it's, it's treason. It's a traitor's flag. And even at the time when the war was over, now certainly people fighting the war for the North did say Southerners are traitors. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. That's a term that was used at the time. But after the war was over, no one was ever prosecuted for treason, no one. And I think that's instructive because the majority of the people in the North didn't think that would be a very good idea because Southerners were being accepted back into the Union. And to paint them as traitors would make a very difficult process. Jefferson Davis, of course, was held in chains for a very long period of time but he was never tried for treason. One of the rumors is that he couldn't be tried for treason because they couldn't convict him. And, of course, Albert Taylor Bledsoe wrote his very famous Is Davis a Traitor? It was going to be used, theoretically, as the legal defense for secession. So one of the important things we can do is talk about secession and how this was something that Americans, both North and South, particularly in the founding period, thought was completely possible. When you look at the Constitution itself, one of the arguments made is that the Constitution, in fact, was an act of secession uh, because the states that were ratifying the document were seceding from the Articles of Confederation, which had a title of perpetual in it. Well, we all know what perpetual means. It's perpetual until there's somebody leaves it. I mean, this is a document. It's a legal document without a designed or delegated end date. That means it's perpetual until parties leave the compact, or a party leaves the compact. It's just a legal document. Anyone can leave a legal document at any time, but that's not the way we look at it. We think this union is indissoluble, that we have an indestructible union of indestructible states. Well, we know that's not true either, Judge Chase, because if Virginia was an indestructible state, you never should have been able to create West Virginia out of Virginia. <laughs> So uh, that was an illegal move. We also know that it's not an indestructible union because during Reconstruction, the southern states were booted out by the Congress. When they just fought four years to leave, now you say um, you're out until you do what we want you to do, which is ratify the 14th Amendment, which a state that's not a state cannot do legally. So it's just amazing to me how all of these arguments are just lost on the people on the left. And these, as James Byard called them, reptiles in Congress at the time. All right, so uh, part 34 of Sayings Buyer for Southerners by Clyde Wilson on Wednesday. Uh, and uh, some great quotes here again. Uh, a couple of good ones by Clyde Wilson himself. Uh, one of them is, is interesting. He's, this is a quote from Clyde himself. Quote, most of the world regards Southern accented English as a sign of a superior person. Yankees pretend to believe it's a mark of ignorance, but they're Pretense in this, as in many other matters, is a cover-up for jealousy. The poet Robert Lowell, a very Bostonian Brahmin of the Boston Brahmins, went to Tennessee as a young man and lived in the tent in Alan Tate's and Caroline Gordon's yard. For the rest of his life, he spoke with a southern accent. You can hear it in the videos of his anti-Vietnam speeches. A very good one. 
He also brings up a quote by the late great Forrest McDonald, who said, quote, political scientists and historians are in agreement that federalism is the greatest contribution of the founding fathers to the science of government. It is also the only feature of the Constitution that has been successfully exported that can be employed to protect liberty elsewhere in the world. Yet what we invented and others imitate no longer exists on its native shore. And that's 100% true. We have lost. I mean, the war destroyed federalism. That's the important effect of the war. And I'll talk about that in the last uh, article of the week. So, great stuff there. Read it again. Some very worthwhile quotes. Uh, on uh, Thursday, we ran uh, the May Top Ten. And um, just to go over those Top Ten articles for the week of May, Hampton Roads, A Twist in the Lincoln Myth by Dave Benner was number one. Number two, Erasing Southern History Step by Step by Alphonse Louis Vin. Number three, Confederate of, uh, Confederophobia, excuse me, An American Epidemic by Paul Graham. Number four, Don't Leave Me Here to Bleed to Death by Karen Stokes. Number five is White Supremacy and Exclusively Southern Ideology by yours truly. Number six, The Imperial and Momentary and Temporary, excuse me, We by Clyde Wilson. Number seven, Lies My Teacher Told Me, The True History of the War for Southern Independence by Clyde Wilson. Number eight, Rethinking the War for Southern Independence by Clyde Wilson. Number nine, Betraying by, Betrayed by Yankees Perverting the Constitution by Bernard Thurzum. And number ten, A Christian Defense of the South by Thomas Bryant. So go ahead and check those out again. We've talked about all of them on the podcast. All right. Uh, Thursday was also John Randolph of Roanoke's birthday. So another very important figure in Southern history. Uh, in some ways, a man who was more Jeffersonian than Jefferson himself, who enjoyed being the opposition. Now, this particular piece by Frederick William Thomas, it was written uh, after Randolph died, but it was a, from a contemporary. You know, so Thomas was writing this in the 19th century. And he is highly critical of John Randolph. It is a character sketch. It's simply talking about who Randolph was as a man. And Randolph was not an easy person to be around. There's no, there's no question about that. He was an aristocrat. And it, he was an aristocratic Republican. Uh, and I think that <laughs> when we look at that, you know, the term aristocrat, I mean, that's how he's described. And even I just used it. Um, Randolph was a conservative in the old European model, but who enjoyed the country lifestyle of, say, the English Whigs. I mean, this is essentially what you look at in cavalier culture. Randolph, more importantly, was a cavalier. I think that's the important designation to make. He was a cavalier. He was a man who was fully aware of the traditions and culture that had been brought over by his ancestors from England to Virginia. And one of the things that Randolph did very well was vote no. And if anything, if anything that comes out of this, this is, again, Southern tradition, John Randolph of Roanoke personified it. He personified it. If there's anything we get out of that, is that a congressman should vote no if a bill is unconstitutional. And Randolph made it very clear when Jefferson became too much of a nationalist during his administration, his second term, that he was against Jefferson, even though the two were related, even though they were both from Virginia, Randolph could not support things that were going on that were unconstitutional. So he made that very clear. And as a result, uh, he became one of the what were called the quids, the other, the third thing. And the quids were a strong voting block in the Congress who opposed Jefferson's move towards nationalism in his second term. Things like the embargo, uh, which he thought was a bad idea, unconstitutional and a very bad idea. Uh, so Randolph, in that way, was such an important figure. But the interesting thing about Randolph, again, was his character. Uh, this is a man who loved the fight. He loved the political battle. He loved to get in the trenches and debate, and he was perhaps the best orator that Virginia has ever produced, and we just talked about one who was very, very good in Patrick Henry, but Randolph might have surpassed him. Now, when you read his speeches, particularly later in life, they tend to ramble. They're hard to get through because they become incoherent at times, and one of the things that Randolph had was a grasp 
of literature, history, philosophy, theology, uh, that really was unsurpassed. And so when you read his, his speeches, you have to know those things to understand anything that he's talking about. And that becomes, I mean, that's some of the parts that he becomes very funny. And there's actually an interesting uh, anecdote in here about uh, one of the congressmen who opposed one of his bills. And uh, he stood up and pulled out a watch. This guy was a, was a, was a clock maker. And he asked this congressman, sir, what time is it? And the congressman replied, and Randolph looked at his watch and said, sir, you may, you may fix or amend my tick-ticks, or actually he said, you, you may know tick-ticks, but you don't know tactics. I mean, it's just quintessential Randolph. Uh, so good at using language to his advantage. You may, <laughs> you may understand tick-ticks, but not tactics. And then, of course, he was attacked, and he started quoting Shakespeare in his defense. I mean, nobody does this anymore. Randolph enjoyed the banter. He enjoyed the back and forth. He enjoyed the verbal sparring. Which we don't have in Congress anymore. If you say anything out of the way, if you are sparring with someone, <gasps> you can't do that. You can't. That's, that is ungentlemanly. Randolph was a gentleman's gentleman in terms of who he was. Uh, and one of the things he often did, which this piece doesn't get into. Now, Frederick William Thomas was a cl close friend of Edgar Allan Poe. He, he taught in, in Alabama and uh, at the University of Alabama, and he also uh, was part of two newspapers in the South, one uh, the Richmond Inquirer at one point. But um, he was actually from the North, though. But uh, one thing that this piece does not bring up is Randolph, like to point at the Federalists in the Congress with his bony finger. He was skeleton-like, and I mean, this character sketch gets into that. It's, it's very good in that way, and just describing Randolph. Literary in its description of Randolph. But he used to point a bony finger at the members of the opposition and shout, Yazoo! Because of the Yazoo deal, which was extremely corrupt, and everyone knew it. And he used to point out these people that these people were corrupt. And that is something that Thomas does bring up in this piece, is that Randolph knew every little detail about these people, and he would bring it out to attack them. Their personal foils, their problems, anything they had that he could use against them, he would do it. And he would do it in a way that was cutting. He would do it in a way that would just make you feel small. And he would do it in a very polite way as well often at times. So Randolph was an expert at debate, an expert at speeches, and perhaps the greatest orator the South has ever produced. And he was definitely interested in the Federal Republic. He was not a nationalist. One of the things that I, one of the stories I like to tell, you know, he was against, uh, he was against nullification. Uh, he said that, look, this is stupid. The state should just secede. I mean, if, if you don't, and a lot, of, a lot of Southerners had that position. You know, Nathaniel Macon had that position. Nullification is a bad idea, just secede. Uh, but when the South was threatened, uh, he said he would strap his dying body to his horse and ride out to defend the South against intimidation and coercion. Even though he didn't agree with it, he would not accept it. And, of course, he always said he wanted to be buried facing west, standing up so he could keep his eye on Henry Clay. Right, because Henry Clay was such a dangerous person. He was a nationalist. I mean, this is what Randolph's position was. He was against nationalism. He was a Republican, believed in the Federal Republic. So John Randolph's birthday was June 2nd. We can't get around the fact that, again, here's the Southern tradition and John Randolph being a proponent of that into the early to almost middle of the 19th century. And when Virginia changed its constitution, when they went through a convention, Randolph was there and uh, arguing against some of the innovations that were going on in the Virginia Constitution. He, he was against innovation. He was believed in the old conservative order of Virginia. And then finally on June 3rd, we had Jefferson Davis's birthday. So we ran a piece by Charles Betts Galloway, the Reverend Charles Betts Galloway. This piece was originally published in 1908. And Galloway, this is a very long piece, and uh, if you print it out, it's going to be many, many pages. 
but um, it's a really nice survey of who Jefferson Davis was uh, his, and his importance in Southern history. It's a character sketch, again, of Jefferson Davis. Um, this speech was made in Mississippi, and uh, then it was widely printed, and people read it all throughout the United States, not just in the South. Now, critics will say, well, this is just lost cause myth- mythology, but um, I-, I think when you look at it, Americans, North and South, believed in this by 1908. And one of the interesting quotations in in the piece was near the end of the piece. Uh, Where Galloway says, And now, young men of of our reunited country, sons of heroic sires, proud of the flag that floats over us, which he's talking about the U.S. flag at that point, and jealous of its increasing unfading glory, Glad that there is a star on it that answers to the name of Mississippi. I commend to your emulation the words of solemn counsel and patriotic encouragement with which Mr. Davis concluded his masterly and monumental work. And he's talking about the rise and fall of the Confederate government. And so Davis said this, quote, In asserting the right of secession, it has been my wish to incite to its exercise. It has not been my wish, I'm sorry, to excite to its exercise. So Davis is saying, we tried. I'm not saying that uh, we need to do it again. I recognize the fact that war showed it to be impracticable, but not illegal. And Davis says, but this did not prove that it was wrong. And now that it may not be again attempted, and the Union may promote the general welfare, it is needful that the truth, the whole truth, should be known so that crimination and recrimination may forever cease. And then, on the basis of fraternity and faithful regard for the rights of the states, the important part, there may be written on the Arch of the Union, Esto Perpetua. So uh, he, he's saying that the Union will be perpetual, but he's saying the rights of the states should be faithfully adhered to. And when you look at Confederate monuments that were put up in the late 19th and early 20th century, the one in Columbus, Georgia is a nice example, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it says that that monument represents the cause for which those men fought and forever recognizes the perpetual role of states' rights. This is the important part of the legacy of secession and the Confederate cause of independence, is that federalism should not die just because the war was over, because the South lost. And everyone throughout the United States, a lot of Northerners as well, were recognizing this. We cannot let that die. This is why people like Johnson and others after the war was over said, look, we're just putting the Union back together. We denied secession, and we've changed the social and political order of the United States by eliminating slavery. And Galloway talks about that and said, Southerners are glad it's gone. But what should not happen is that states' rights and federalism should not die. As Forrest MacDonald pointed out, it did. Now, Galloway in 1908 thought that Jefferson would be remembered by Americans forever as one of the greatest of heroes that America has ever produced. Now in the state of Kentucky, they want to take down his statue. That was blocked by a 7-2 to two vote, but I can guarantee you it will come up for a vote again. And maybe in the future there won't be seven votes to stop it. Davis did come down at Texas. So in 1908, Galloway thought Davis would be remembered, North and South, as one of the greatest of of Americans that America had ever produced. And in our uh, keynote speech at our last conference in February, we had Jefferson Davis's direct descendant, Bertram Hayes Davis, talk about how Davis was important, not just for Southern history, but for the fabric of American history. He was an American hero and patriot whose fingerprints are all over Washington, D.C. In fact, Davis was the guy who helped redesign the U.S. Capitol building. He was Secretary of War. He was a United States Senator. He was from West, he graduated from West Point, fought in the Mexican War, was married for a time to Zachary Taylor's daughter. President Zachary Taylor who many Americans consider to be one of the greatest of American 
generals, and he was a southerner through and through. So we forget Jefferson Davis at our own peril. We forget that Jefferson Davis was a real American hero, that he should be celebrated in that light. Not as a traitor, and this is this this piece gets into that, the fact that the North was agitating for secession long before the South. And in many ways that that agitation led to the war. And one thing that uh, Galloway brings up is that secession was an act of peace. It's not an act of war. It was saying, look, fine, you don't like us, we'll leave. And you can have your union and we'll have ours. It was an act of peace. It's an act of people saying, okay, enough. You know, we, you know, we know you don't like us, we'll just leave. We'll exercise our right of self-determination and leave. Now, Davis is saying in his rise and fall of Confederate government, we shouldn't do that anymore. And we can talk about its secession practical today. Or is it not? But the principle, the idea behind it, Davis never said it was wrong. Davis never said it was illegal and it was not treason. He legally defended it. So did Alexander H. Stevens. So did Albert Taylor Bledsoe. People legally defended it as a right in the exercise of self-determination. Abraham Lincoln said that in the 1840s during the war with Mexico. And abolitionists continually spoke of secession in the 1840s. Of course, we know that, and as Galloway brings up, Northerners talked about it several times. They also talked about it in 1814. They talked about it in 1803. They talked about it in 1800. They talked about it in 1794 because it was recognized in those early instances of secession, particularly in 1794 and 1800 and 1803, and even in 1814, there were still men alive who were members of the founding generation. And they understood that secession was perfectly possible and legal. That anyone can do that through the right of self-determination. And it should not be coerced. You should not force these people to be in a union if they don't want to be. That is the very definition of tyranny and despotism and imperialism. So I think this long piece by Galloway, it's very good. It, it talks about Davis's character, who he was as a man from, from his earliest days until uh, his death. And uh, again, I'm sure people will say, this is just lost cause, nostalgia, nonsense. You can't get around the fact who Davis was as a man and who Davis was to the fabric of American history. These people were quintessentially American. And so when we talk about that with the flag, we talk about that with people like Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry is quintessentially American. John Randolph of Roanoke is quintessentially American. And so was Jefferson Davis. There is a continuity between the three of them. And that continuity needs to be continually emphasized if we are going to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. And it is just that. What those three men represent, which is the American principle of self-determination, the American principle of federalism, because that's what all three of them respected, and ultimately the American tradition of state power and the people of the states having control of their own destiny. I think if we can do that, if we can put the dots together on a continual basis, people will understand what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, and they will understand that the South is America. Until next time, good day. Good day.